Hi and welcome back to the second part of this uh, week's lectures on learning in mathematics. Uh, in, the, in the first part of the lecture this week we talked about learning as being stirred into practices and how learning at school has become situated and, and then students have inadvertently learned that maths is a school subject that has nothing to do with the rest of their life. So how can we um, help students to see maths as something that goes beyond what their experience is at school? How can they transfer it to the rest of their life? So I hope you had a chance to engage with those ideas and really think about them and reflect on them deeply, particularly as you embark on your career as a teacher. Uh, like the first part of this week's lecture, that I'm not giving you YouTube clips to follow up or anything this time. Again, I hope you just find a chance to uh, sit and uh, reflect quietly and, and think about yourself as a teacher of mathematics. Um, we know that in terms of the education of students in the future, while we can have great curriculums, great classes, great resources, the actual people that make it, the only people who really make a difference are you as the teachers. And so that's why we're trying to spend all this time working on you as your, and your mathematics and your teaching of mathematics. Uh, this second part will have more practical ideas rather than um, things that might be more esoteric. But in the end, they should all be practical. So the first sort of learning we want to talk about is transition method of teaching and learning. And I'm pretty sure you would be very familiar with this because this is what we would call the traditional method. It's based on a theory called behavioralism. And behavioralism was developed uh, through things like teaching rats to run maze. Uh, it works really well if you want rats to run mazes. And, but unfortunately, teaching in school is not quite as simple as having kids run mazes. Um, but in, in this approach, what happens is the teacher transmits transmits known knowledge and facts to the students, the students absorb it, and then the students, this leads to what we call instrumental understanding. Um, in other words, you might start the lesson, you'll put some notes up on the board, then you'd give some worked examples, and then you'd say to the students, you go and do these 50 exercises. All right? Looks a bit like I do, uh, we do, you do maybe. Now there's some benefits to this. Uh, this sort of approach simplifies education to a very narrow channel that you get the students to run in. And so therefore it's quite easy for you as a teacher to plan. You don't have to worry too much about what students think or can do or what other diversions they might have. You just set the channel and make sure they run in it and reward them for staying in that channel. Um, it's usually much easier to get the right answer more quickly and the rewards are more immediate and apparent for students. They know when they can do it. The problem with this is it's not really very consistent with what mathematics is like. It's, it's not a good way, you can't teach problem solving or mathematical reasoning with this, you can't solve significant problems, you can only really regurgitate things that someone already knows. And so sometimes that's important. Sometimes there's something, a procedure you just want them to do, and then this is the best way to do it, as far as we can tell. But it doesn't help develop relational understanding. So relational understanding is more about conceptual learning, understanding the concepts and the ideas. Uh, and it's about developing connections between the concepts and the conceptual idea and the relationships and also the procedural knowledge, how to do things, the symbols and rules and that sort of stuff. So it's more complex, it's more consistent with what mathematics is like. It's not just knowing something, it's also being able to do something and work around with things and how those things are related to other parts of mathematics. So if you learn these sorts of things, maths in this relational sort of way, then it's more adaptable to new tasks. You can apply it in other places because it's not just a specific narrow thing, it's much broader. Um, usually it's easier to remember because it's more connected and related to other things. And having understood one thing, often it helps you seek to know and understand other things. So to give a, a, a metaphor about this, it's a bit like if you came on a campus and you asked me how to get to a certain place. Now I could do one of two things. I could get the map out, draw a line on the map and say, just go here, here, you know, go straight ahead, turn right, then go left, walk for 100 metres and turn right and you're there. That would help you get to that place. So that would be instrumental understanding. You could achieve that, but the problem is you couldn't get anywhere else on campus. Relational understanding would be, I'd say, well, here's a map and this is how you read a map. Here's where you, here's one place you want to go and here's where you, you are now. So how could you work out a path? 
So one's teaching them a specific path, whereas one's teaching them more about how to work out lots of paths. Anyway, I'm sure you've seen lots of instrumental learning and uh, behavioralistic type teaching, and sometimes it's appropriate. But often we need to have something which is more relational and develops deeper conceptual understanding. So how do students learn maths? Well, the sad answer is we don't really know. <coughs> We got some ideas and that's what this lecture and the, pre and the first part were based on, but, but I can't give you a specific answer. Because as we've said all along, it depends on what's being learned. It depends on where it's being learned and it depends on who is learning. It depends on what they've learned before, what they've already know. So you're gonna to have to make these decisions, um, not, not now, but when you are on prac with your students and you get to meet them and understand them and what their needs are, what the material is, you happen to be trying to teach them and for them to understand at the time. But these are some general ideas and you need to have this as a palette of things you can pick up and try. But the short answer is there's no recipe. There is no one best practice. I cannot give you one way to teach everything in mathematics that'll work everywhere. <clears throat> and I know that's perhaps not a bit dis dissatisfying for you, but we're really confident that if you engage with all these things we've talked about over this course and, and all your other courses, then you'll be great teachers and you'll be able to work this out as you go. This is why teaching is a profession. You work it out as you go in response. You have to make decisions and professional judgments. In the Maths 1 and Maths 2, you would have got some specific um, ideas to help you start that, but you're always open to modify those as well. So one of the theorists you might have studied about before was called Piaget. And um, Piaget has been a big influencer on curricula in most Western countries. Some of his ideas, he even moved on. So when he started, Piaget said, when you're this age, you can do this, and when you're this age, you can do this, and when you can this age, you can do that. Uh, it was called an ages and stages model. Uh, and if you look at the maths curriculum, it's largely built on that. He said, you start with concrete things, and then as you go ahead, you can move to abstractions. Now, what we can take from Piaget is not, we don't think anymore that when you're five, you can do this, and when you're eight, you can do this, and when you're 10, because people develop at different stages. But more this idea of moving from concrete towards abstraction. So if you start with some concept, when it's new to you, whether you're five or whether you're 12, try and start with a concrete representation and then move towards abstraction as you go. And if you're moving along that continuum, and you would have done this, for example, when you learned a number in, in Maths 1, right? you started with the concrete materials, you then moved to pictures of the concrete materials, then you moved to a T-chart, then you used to digits that represent the T-charts, and then you drop the T-chart, that sort of stuff. That was moving from concrete materials to an abstraction. And in the end, you don't want the kids to keep using their concrete materials. You want them to move towards being able to use much more powerful mathematical ideas, which are the abstract representations. And you're all illustrations that we can all do that in number. Right? But you still see some kids who need concrete representations. You ask them a question and they'll still go like this with their fingers. That means the teacher hasn't helped them move towards abstractions. But the other thing to know as a teacher is as you move towards abstraction, when they're learning, <clears throat> if they get stuck, sometimes come back a little bit towards, not back to the start necessarily, but just go back a little bit and then help them move forward again is a good way of understanding how people develop mathematical ideas. So that comes from Piaget. <clears throat> Something else you will see a lot of in mathematics is rote learning. Uh, I'm pretty sure most people would have rote learned their times tables. In fact, on the back of your toilet door, there may have been a poster of the times tables which you are forced to memorise. Now, one of the things that people say is that practice makes perfect, and this is not correct. Practice makes permanent. So what you've got to do is make sure that when you practise something, i.e. you do rote learning, you're practising the right things because it becomes permanent. So by the, the corollary of that is if you practise the wrong things, they will also become permanent like a bad habit. Um, I'll give you an example. When I uh, 
moved to the place we lived before here, I decided I'd like to play golf. So I went to the golf course, got some golf clubs and started hacking my way around the course. And after a few months, I was going okay, but I thought it was probably time to get a lesson. The problem is when I went to get my lesson, I'd practiced my hacking technique so much that they'd become permanent. So the first thing the instructor had to do was to unteach me my bad habits before I could then go and learn the new ones. It's harder to learn something properly when you've already made permanent something that's incorrect. So what are the implications for teaching mathematics? Well, first of all, mathematical exercises. Again, I'm sure you did a lot of mathematical exercises from textbooks when you're at school, and they have a place. It's a form of rote learning or practice. The problem is where do they come in the learning sequence? The idea of mathematical exercises is to practice something so it becomes automatic or you become fluent in it. And that's a good thing once you understand and know what you're doing. The problem is when we get students to do mathematical exercise or do rote learning or practice of something that they don't quite yet understand. So if you're going to give students exercises and practice and things like that, make sure they're doing something that they really understand and can do because you don't want them to go away and do a mathematics challenge on something that they can't do. They might practice it a lot at home and then all of a sudden they've made it permanent. And then for you to help them move on, you have to then help them unlearn what they've learned to help them move forward. The second thing is the learning sequence. Sometimes I hear people say, you know, here's an example, go away and practice it. Um, don't worry if you don't get it, just practice it and we'll v revisit it again next year. The problem is if they don't get it and they go and practice it, you could be making permanent their mistakes. So make sure again they clearly understand it. Make sure that the practice comes after they really understand and can do something well and you are confident about that. Don't get them to practice something that they're really not sure about. So exercises, rote learning, practice comes later in the sequence of things you already can do. And of course the key thing here is homework. And we've moved on a bit on this if you see now uh, ideas of the flipped classroom, which I've, uh, I'm sure you've heard about. The idea here is what we've done in the past is we'd teach kids stuff at school, we'd have a lesson, and then we'd run out of time, so we'd say, I'll oh, go away and do all this practice at home. Now the problem is when they go home, there's no one them to help correct their mistakes or misconceptions to answer their questions or queries. So they'll just plow through and do all the homework and do all this practice unsupervised. And if they're not doing it right, then they'll make permanent, with all that practice, their mistakes. So the idea of the flip classroom was, you'd go home and read the materials, maybe watch a, a, a video or something from your teacher, and then you come back to class and do the practice on the exercises where the supervision is. Because that way, that's when they're actually doing the practice and they need the help around uh, ameliorating any misconceptions or ideas, and you, you're there to support them. So be really careful about what you give for homework. Don't send kids home to practice something that they don't yet understand or can do very well, because you could be setting them up for failure. All right, here's another random idea, learning from experience. Uh, when you learn, what we do as teachers is often, mostly make up experience, mathematical experiences or activities for students to do. And what they do is they do these activities um, and then we assume they're going to learn the mathematics from it. The problem is often they don't know what the mathematics is they're supposed to do. They don't notice and note down the important things. So I think having good mathematical experiences is important and lots of activities. But one of the key things you need to do as a teacher is ask good prompts and questions so they can metacognitively reflect on what they've done and then help them to notice the key things and note them down. So you could do a wonderful lesson on patterns, but if you don't help the kids notice the patterns and develop a rule towards uh, algebraic thinking, they may just think it's about patterns and have nothing to do with mathematics at all. So part of your job as a teacher is to, as they go through these experience, helping them to notice the important features you've, you've got planned for them in this experience. And then once they've noticed them, help them to note it down and write it down or, or record it some way so they can reflect on it. This is how you build the mathematical knowledge from an activity. 
and I'll give you an example in a sec. But the point here is not just good enough to have mathematical activities. You actually have to help them to see the underlying mathematics and, and generalize it so they can pull it out. Uh, I remember I had a student in my class one year and I knew her dad and I said to him, oh, how's so-and-so enjoying maths? He said, oh, she's having a great time. She loves it. She's really doing, uh, you know, enjoys coming, but she's just worried she's not learning anything. And the problem is we'd done all these rich mathematical activities, but I'd never really made it clear to them what the mathematics was. And so that told me I had to do more work as a teacher to help them to see those things. So here's an example. Uh, one of the things you might have done in high school is translations of functions. Uh, hopefully you done, this is not a primary school one, I tried to pick something that might be related to your own mathematical experience of recent years. So students learn there's various things about how the uh, formula of a function relates to where it's positioned. So what you could do is help the students draw the graphs, so they could do it manually if you want, or they could do it do some sort of software package. And then the key thing here is not that they can draw the graphs, but to ask them, what do you notice the difference is? What do you see? And what you could see is the first one is y equals x squared, and the second one is y equals x squared plus 3. What do you notice about the first one and the second one? What do you think would happen if we did y equals x squared minus 4, or something like that? All right, so you can see the mathematical activity is, in itself is simple enough, it's those key questions you ask and prompt them to think about so they notice and note down the mathematics you want them to learn. So is this some sort of uh, instructional model which might help? One of the things we know, and again from the first part of this lecture, is that students learn maths at school but they don't necessarily learn how to apply it very well. And often what happens if you give kids exercises, you know, in a standard textbook, the first 20 are just straight maths problems and the last five of these applied word problems. And the kids can do all the first 20 and then they get the word problems and they get stuck because they don't see them as connected in any way. So it's not good enough just to teach them the mathematical content and assume that they will be able to apply it. You have to teach them how to apply it. And I think this is a good way of doing it. So often what we do is we start with mathematical concepts or ideas. And then after we've taught them the mathematical concepts or ideas, we try and get them to apply it in context. So we might teach them um, about the areas of rectangles, do the formula and everything like that. Hopefully we might have done it more like we talked about last time. And then after they've learned the area of a rectangle, they've learned that the area equals length times breadth, we then say, Johnny's got a paddock which is 16 metres by 5 metres. What's the area of his or, paddock? Johnny has a paddock which is 16 metres by 10 metres. He needs to apply fertiliser at 1 kilogram per 10 square metres. How much fertiliser does he need? And what we find is that even though the kids can be really good at doing the mathematical idea, area equals length times breadth, as soon as we put it in context, they have no idea because we haven't taught them to apply it. In my mind, this is one of the easiest ways to do it. <coughs> <coughs> Rather than starting with the mathematical concept or ideas, start with the mathematical problem in context. So if you remember back to the first uh, half of this week's lecture, when we did it, we started off, what's the area of our classroom? And the question might be, how much carpet do we need to put down the classroom or, or something like that? Start with the problem in context and then after you do that, see if you can then generalise out the mathematical idea. So we still want kids to learn that area equals length times breadth for a rectangle, but we start with the in-context problem and then we generalise out to get the mathematical idea. And then if they've done that, they're much more able to see it and apply it in other contexts because they've started it in a context anyway. Try it, see how you go. Um, this is something I try to do fairly regularly with my classes. Here's some other ideas that have become more uh, prominent recently, learning with the brain in mind. Uh, there's a lot more work going on around brain science, and again, we can't actually look in people's brains, we don't know what's happening, but they'll put things and sensors on people's heads and from that they make some assumptions. But here's some of the things we do know. And this is from the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, which is the peak body uh, in America. They said that mathematics makes sense. All students must believe this, and all teachers must believe in their students. 
how do we help them make sense of mathematics? Uh, I'll talk about this now as we go. But one of the first things I want to talk about before I get to that is about memory. Um, what we, when we teach kids stuff, we want them to learn it and remember it. Um, so we know that if someone's uh, looking at something or learning something, that in their immediate memory it lasts for about 30 seconds. And then after that, if you can process it into working memory, it lasts for about 10 to 20 minutes. But if you want to stir it long term, then it needs to go, uh, in your long term storage there's two parts, explicit memory which is experientially based, and implicit memory which is like automatic responses. So implicit memory is just things you don't have to think about really. When you drive your car, you probably don't think too much about what you're doing with your feet, or a lot of the uh, movements you do, it's just implicit, you do it. But explicit memory is things we want them to remember, and often the more experientially rich it is, um, the more they like to rem remember it. So if you think back, uh, often this is why music is a great uh, prompter of memories, or smells, you might smell something and it takes you back something. So the more ways you can make it experientially rich, the more likely people are to remember it. Um, but we do know that knowledge will not be stored in long-term memory unless it makes sense and is meaningful. So that relates back to the quote we had on the last slide. So what does this mean as a teacher? If you want the kids to remember stuff, make sure it makes sense and it's meaningful to the students. Um, you'll get frustrated because you'll teach the kids and you'll say to them, oh, I remember what we did yesterday when we were looking at triangles and they'll all look at you and go, no. And the reason is, you didn't move it to long-term storage, it was in their working memory and it got eliminated because the brain thought this uh, information wasn't relevant. So, how do we ensure it makes sense? Does it make sense? Can the learner understand the mathematical ideas? Does it fit with what they already know? So if you get students, and believe me, I've heard this many times, I don't understand, then you have to actually do something about that. If you don't do something about it, the kids won't remember it. So if they say they don't understand, what does that mean? Well, you have to try and show them in a different way. You have to get them to see it in a different way. There's no point just repeating what you've already just done because they didn't get it the first time and they're not going to get it if you repeat it. Sometimes get another student to explain it to them might help. But it's not good enough as a teacher to leave kids with the, the statement, I don't understand. It means you have to revisit it again. The second thing is, um, how does something have meaning? Because remember the two ways of putting stuff in long-term memory was it makes sense and it's meaningful. Um, one of the, I remember one time a student was in class and they were doing something and another student says, oh, I don't get this. And the student next to them said, don't worry, it's maths, you don't need to get it, just remember it. And of course they didn't. So mathematics can always make sense and they should always be able to understand it and get it if that's what you're putting in their experiential world of their classroom in mathematics. Does it have meaning? Is it relevant to them now? Why should they remember it? Maybe it's going to be useful for them sometimes. Maybe it's going to be useful in the future. Maybe it's interesting. Uh, <clears throat> of course, it's always interesting. You know, the answer to that question, when am I ever going to use this? All right, why do I need to know this is a question you'll get asked a lot. Or when will I ever use this? The answer can't be, well, you'll use it in the test uh, in next week. You need to have a reasonable answer. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they will use it, but you need to show them at least someone might use it. So trying to help it have meaning for the students is not just important to make for motivation, it actually makes it more memorable. Otherwise, what you've teach, taught them in the class, what they've learned, will often be forgotten and you'll have to go back and start again. All right, next idea, developing a mathematical identity. So this sounds a bit, uh, I don't know, like a, an academic idea, but really what it's about is <coughs> developing students' uh, mathematical identity, there, seeing themselves as mathematicians, and it relates to their history, their emotions, their values, and their responses to mathematics, and it includes their knowledge and skills. It's a more holistic way of looking at it. So sometimes it could be looked like this. In maths education, we're trying to put ideas in their head, i.e. knowledge. We're trying to build um, attitudes, values, emotions, dispositions, motivations, so we'll call that the heart. 
and we're trying to give them some skills, so we can call that the hand. Now, if you just have one of these things, then you're probably not developing a strong and robust mathematical identity. You're not going to go on in mathematics. You're not going to see mathematics as something relevant and useful. We need all three. So some way of thinking about that is developing a mathematical identity. And you might like to think about yourself. How is your mathematical identity? Um, some of you might have really good head knowledge, but you really don't like maths and you think it's a waste of time. Some of you might have good skills. You can do uh, algorithms and things but you don't understand them, what they mean, or where they might be used. So it's, we really need the whole package. And as a teacher, you need to try and develop the whole package. And so we'll call that a mathematical identity. Here's a quote. I like this quote. Um, the teacher who knows their subject well must introduce it to the students in a way one would introduce a friend. The students must know why the teacher values this subject. In other words, you have to value mathematics how the subject has transformed your life. And by the same token, the teacher must value the students as potential friends, be vulnerable to the ways the students may transform the teacher's relationship with the subject as well as be transformed. If I'm invited to a friendship between two people, I will not enter unless I feel I'm valued as well. So, maybe you could think about teaching mathematics like this. You have a friendship relationship with mathematics. You know stuff about it, you do stuff with mathematics, and you have an emotional and uh, value connection with mathematics. And your job as a teacher to, as, to invite students to join you in that friendship relationship. What does that look like? That might sound a bit silly for some of you, but for some people it might be a way of thinking about teaching and learning mathematics that helps you um, understand what your work as a teacher is. Uh, and related to this, it could be that the teacher, your job is to build a, a bridge between the student and the subject and mathematics. So this means that you already have a relationship with mathematics and it has to be positive, has to be knowledgeable, has to be skillful. And your job is about developing positive attitudes or at least not developing bad attitudes towards to mathematics. And it also means that as you're teaching it, that the students will experience something that is useful and interesting. And indeed, the pedagogy that you do is, in, is mathematical, not just regurgitating stuff and memorising someone else's mathematical facts. All right, again, I've given you a whole palette of ideas. What I hope is um, you'll go back and look at some of these. Some of them you might say, uh, I don't relate to that. Some of it you might think is really useful. But again, we've left the space this week because we think it's really important for you to now stop and think about yourself as a learner of mathematics and how that influences you as a teacher and a maker of learning for students in maths. So how do you like to learn? How have you noticed that others like to learn? And think about how might you organise your classroom to maximise learning for all? These are not easy simple questions. As I've said many times, there is no recipe or answer for this because it depends. It depends on you as a teacher, depends on who the kids are, depends on the context you're teaching in, depends on the material at the time you're teaching. But this is the main crux of your job. This is what you'll be doing. And again, if you engage and reflectively think about all this stuff, we're sure you'll do a great job. All right, I hope some of these ideas are challenging and interesting for you. Um, good luck.